الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما بعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى abundantly and we ask Allah to exalt the mention, grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم upon his companions and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى And the male is unlike the female. This particular uh, part of an ayah from the Book of Allah lays down a foundation that today we are forced to discuss. Even though, technically speaking, we shouldn't be discussing this. This should not be a subject it should not be a topic and no time should be wasted if we may use that term for lack of better words to discuss this issue but of course because of the gap and the time uh, away from the Prophet والسلام, and that, that blessed era today we have to address issues because the Muslims try to change them and we have it's an obligation on those who invite to Allah to remind the Muslims about the basics of the religion nothing advanced nothing sophisticated nothing modern just the basics of our deen and this is being discussed tonight because there's a phenomena again in the Muslim Ummah where we see women becoming men or attempting to become like men and fighting for that so-called right that they have which we men are depriving them of so we're being demonized as men for trying to restrict women's liberty and freedom and they are the uh, righteous, pious, God-fearing you know, creatures who are trying to simply defend their right which supposedly Islam gave them and in this effort of theirs there, there are many issues and misconceptions that they bring to the table and unless one is familiar with the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the righteous predecessors one may fall into their traps and may believe that what they're calling to is some sort of haqq even though it is the ultimate battle and you get amazed at how often this happens today just before I came to the masjid someone sent me a link it's almost hilarious a link of a Maulana, supposedly Maulana uh, from uh, Bawerli, Bavirli, whatever they call them. Beverly, that's what I want to call them. <laughs> Not the, the Obendis, the other ones. Barilvi. This guy, the Mufti on TV, was saying it is not only it is uh, your salah behind the Imams of Saudi is invalid, you go to Haram, you pray behind. Ma'agli, uh, Sudais, not only your salah is invalid, but you're also sinful. Because the salah, because the sin in the haram is multiplied, so you praying behind these imams is multiplied. So basically, you come to do umrah or hajj and you go back with loads of sins. It's not permissible to pray behind them because Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they believe that we believe that they're mushrikeen and he's telling the people he's telling the people why do we Muslims consider them mushrikeen they say according to him we say if you ask this brother for help you're a mushrik so he's telling the people why it is the logic he said forget about you they us yani, the people living in Saudi we they don't even consider you as Muslims they consider you mushrik how do we label them as mushrik by merely asking him for assistance which is a lie against us so therefore he's saying your salah is invalid and you are sinful 
And he said, this is the unanimous fatwa of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. All the muhaqqiqeen and the mufakkireen. And he cannot even pronounce these words properly in Arabic. Huh? All of them agree that you cannot pray in Saudi Arabia. This is a mufti who issues fatwa on TV with people calling in and inquiring about the deen. Something that blatant, wild. So then you don't get shocked when we also have to discuss now or we are now we are forced to defend men before you had to defend the women because their rights were being taken now you have to advise you know the sister to take it easy on her husband and the time of the prophet ﷺ, the men were advised to take it easy with the woman now you advise the woman to take it easy with the husbands because she's saying we're equal in the house he's a spouse i'm a spouse he's a uh, you know, the son of Adam and I'm the daughter of Adam. We, we just go 50-50 on everything. So, the end result is women playing the role of men specifically in da'wah. And they say da'wah, this is a, an obligation in every Muslim male and female and it is our God-given right. True. No one is going to deny that. No one will say w women are not expected to give da'wah. They are expected to give da'wah according to their abilities. But here we have to underline the word abilities because under abilities is certain restrictions that Islam placed on the women. And this is the part that these Muslims, modern Muslims, maybe not their fault. In fact, it is not their fault. Very often, the, the Muslims who, are, who come from the West or who embrace Islam in the West, the only version of Islam that is available to them is the modernized, westernized version. And they really think that they're following Islam while they're following a, a, a type of Islam that has some truthfulness to it and authenticity and the rest is just a lot of sugarcoating and compromising to please the non-Muslims who amongst whom they live. Really, that's what it boils down to. Some of them, alhamdulillah, Allah saves from all this dilemma and they come to the truth. Many of them, they're, they're, that's all they know. They, that's all they know. So when they go there, it's very normal for a sister to be giving this lecture. And you brothers will be sitting just like that. I'm not going to tell you to go see it on YouTube because I don't want to gain the sin. But this is on YouTube. A sister giving a lecture to the brothers, brothers and sisters, huh? And the brother is at the proximity of like half a meter. No, you missed something. You missed the henna. There's a special design, beautified hands, just for the pleasure of the men. And then woe to you, O oh man, if you say anything, you, you sick-minded pervert. Huh? That, that's the crazy part. Ya khifir Allah, you're coming here to see the light of ilm. You, the sister is trying to teach you the deen. All you're focusing on is her hands and you're focusing on this. You are the sick-minded pervert. That's, that's the, the conclusion. And then we say, look, that is all opinions. We have to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, which determine whether this kind of behavior is normal or abnormal. Is it normal for a man to be observing a woman lecturing and be able to focus 100% on the content? Is that normal or is it abnormal? And he will, according to human nature, examine her, inspect her, check her out, evaluate her and then pass a judgment. I don't know, ask the men. Unless every man is a pervert on earth. Ask them. Now the funniest thing in the world is that that same lecture where the sister, mashallah, was educating the ummah. <laughs> you scroll down, the third comment is from a brother. Mashallah, this sister is so beautiful. I would love to marry her! Exclamation mark. And I'm like, yes. He's, it's not his fault. And people were telling him what I just told you. You are sick-minded, you pervert, you this and that, the innocent brother, you know. 
he became a psycho because he simply followed the instincts which Allah Azza wa Jal created him upon. And so now we have to remind the people that it doesn't work this way. And that the ahadith and the ayat in the Quran indicate that a man has no control over that natural attraction towards women. And therefore Islam came with all of these foundations and guidelines about mixing, about communication, about dress code, about lowering the gaze, all of these for what? If, if we could just hang out with each other with zero feelings and, and so on and so forth, then none of these would be necessary. Now we don't deny that you will find among 10 men, one who is weird, who really hangs out with the woman like he's one of them. We say that's his problem, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That issue is with that brother, may Allah make him more of a masculine human being, but that's his problem. Now you cannot use him as a yardstick and say, well, the other nine are perverts. This is the, mashallah, the rational one, the one who's yani, firm. No, he has issues. These are normal men. Why? That's just the way it is. The Prophet ﷺ, in his hadith, when he told the Sahaba, whether it is Ali anhu or others, about lowering the gaze. Lowering the gaze. And he said, the first look, the accidental look, is yours the other one is against you it's against you means it's a sin so you looking at that woman is a sin how are you going to reconcile the ahadith which are commanding you to lower the gaze and the ayat in the Quran tell the believing men to lower the gaze how are you going to reconcile between the commands of lowering the gaze and the fact that you are watching a sister giving a lecture we ask these people for an explanation. Someone, can someone reconcile? Can someone, someone is telling you, uh, you need to swim from this side of the swimming pool till the other side, but don't get wet. I think the time has come for men can sit behind the screen. And the right. <laughs> behind this, which screen? TV? Yes, you know, everything is being now, exactly. They're, they're twisting the, the facts. So it is impossible to reconcile between these ahadith and these ayat and the fact that you're going to be watching a woman giving a lecture. Unless the sister comes to lecture the, the brothers and everybody, mashallah, is looking down on the ground. If they were to do this, we would say, fantastic, you've done well. Show us one of these lectures where the sisters were speaking to the men and the men were behaving in this fashion. So we can go give him a star and stick it on his head. But you will find that this is not the case. Because all of these kind of environments are not set up to be built upon these fundamental principles of our deen. They've been altered and changed to meet the modern world and the modern needs. Even if it's on the expense of changing Islam. <clears throat> so here we have to then deal with the issue that men or male, the male is unlike the female. Islam made a distinction between male and female. Allah Azza wa the creator of male and female made a distinction between them from so many different aspects. And if you go into the scientific aspects of it, biologically speaking, the, the actual physical body, which is obvious to each and every one of us, the difference between the man and the woman emotionally, the difference between man and woman mentally, in even in the, the, the brain, the cells, there's a variation. And this is supported by the fact that in many cases, Islam requires two female witnesses versus only one when it comes to the male. And so many other elements which are clear in our religion, unambiguous. That there's, they're not the same. Now they're not the same does not necessarily mean that one is ultimately superior to the other. In, in the ultimate sense. However, there are areas of superiority for the men over the women. And that is a general principle. And there are exceptions where some women are better than men. Like Aisha radiallahu anha, like Khadija, like Asiya, like Maryam. 
These were women whom the Prophet ﷺ specifically said that they have reached perfection in the sense that many men would never reach and had never reached. But nevertheless, no Prophet has ever been a woman and no messenger has ever been a woman. So either the sisters have to understand this, the sisters have to understand this the most. When Islam, when Islam teaches us these distinctions between us, why are you feeling insulted? Or why do you feel offended? Or why do you feel the need to argue and debate and negotiate? When these laws have been laid down by Allah Azza wa Jal, what is the concept of a Muslim is one who submits to Allah Azza wa Jal. What is all this discussion for? It's a baseless discussion to try to argue otherwise. Where are they equal? They're equal in terms of Iman. In a sense that each male or female is entitled to believe and to do righteous deeds. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاطًا طَيْبًا Whoever does righteous deeds, whether male or female, while being a believer, then they will lead a happy life. And they're equal in terms of jaza. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, each one is entitled to enter paradise or will go to hell based on the choices and the deeds we had performed in this life. But in terms of roles and responsibility, we are not the same. Men have a role to play and women have a role to play. The role of men is to be the du'at ultimately. And women may be du'at amongst other women amongst other women. So if they arrange, and preferably not in a masjid, but if they arrange where a sister will go to other sisters' homes and they have their own classes and the sister is the one educating them and there are no men present, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. This is khair. But once we go outside of these boundaries, then we have an issue. And the saddest thing about this, that the argument which is often brought forth is Aisha radiallahu anha. They say, Aisha used to teach men. She was a shaykha, alima, and she taught men. And we asked these people to produce an evidence, a single evidence, wherein Aisha radiallahu anha taught men without a veil, without a partition between them. We already have the asl. The asl is in the Quran. فَاسْأَلُهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ hijab. Speaking about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah said, if you ask them mata'an, if you ask them for anything, ask them from behind a veil and a partition. So for someone to say, Aisha radiallahu anha violated this explicit ayah in the Quran, which was speaking to the mothers of the mother of the believers, the mothers of the believers, and she went against it, we say, produce your evidence. Now here's the irony. Will you find evidences? Yes. Guess from who? Where would you find an evidence against Aisha? With, with which group? With the Shia. With the Rafidah. So look at this scheme here. Rafidah fabrications, Shia fabrications who hate Aisha and accuse her to be so many things that I don't even want to say, have conveniently invented lies against her where these people from Ahl Sunnah who may not be followers of the Shia come across these narrations. Now mind you, 99% of these people who are propagating this modern Islam know nothing of the Arabic language. They just basically, whatever they Google, that's what they have. They have no access to Arabic language, re authentic sources. So all of them say, Aisha, 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 bring your evidence that Aisha did that. Did that. Where Masruq who said that they could hear her when, when something happened, they would hear her clap from behind the hijab. And he used that term, he used these words, from behind the hijab, when, she would, when the Sahaba would come and question her. Because they used to come and seek fatawi from her, and they always found knowledge with her that they didn't have. No doubt. She was a alima. But that was from behind the partition. She was not going to stand there and display herself in front of them and they use the the you know the, the story of al jamal the whole fitna between ali and muawiyah and uthman anhum, and they say that she went out there and so on and so forth and it's true she went out there 
on the camel and it's something she regretted for the rest of her life. So Masood they said every time she would remember her going out, even though some advised her, she would make her khimar will become soaked with tears because she had gone and she shouldn't have gone. And nevertheless, her going out, she was not standing there in front of the people speaking to them directly. And let's assume hypothetically that that happened. We say this is a case of necessity. She was trying to close the fitna, close the door of fitna and end the war between the Muslims, which was going to be something big. And it was an ishtihad, which was erroneous according to the agreement of the ulama, of Ahl Sunnah. Because we believe that the isma, the one who is infallible, is Allah Azza wa Jal. The rest of the creation are fallible. The issue of the prophets and the messengers, it's a matter of decision. But the rest of the human beings who are not from the prophets and the messengers, inevitably, كُلُّ بْنِ Adam خَطَّى All of them are sinful, including the Sahaba. But that does not take away from their righteousness and piety and the fact that the good deeds erase the, erase the bad deeds and that they have so much good with Allah that any mistakes they make out of ishtihad, they're even excused and they will be rewarded for it. So that's not going to stop us. Using these incidents, trying to justify uh, the idea that a woman is going to lecture men because of supposedly Aisha doing so, we say bring your evidence if you are truthful. And they have a whole setup, but subhanallah, it is not meant to be successful. When you close the door of the whole Aisha evidences because they come from the sources of the, you know, Rafida, they jump onto the next evidence. Who knows what evidence they use to justify that a woman may lecture men? Umar was giving a, a talk to the Muslims, right? And he was speaking about the mahr and that now you're given too much money, sah? He said, and you know, this was not the case at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Then supposedly a woman stood and said, you know, how could you say this when Allah says in the Quran, if you give one of them qintaran and so on and so forth. You know that story? No. That story is the hadith of da'if. It has three different turuq. And all three of these turuq, of this tariqah, this, meaning that chain of narration, all of them are da'if. In fact, this story is inauthentic. Meaning the whole idea that a woman stood in front of the public and told Umar, you are wrong, and he said, you are right, and I am wrong, and he went back on his word and all this. This whole story is inauthentic. Surprise. And guess what? Let us, ya Sheikh, assume that one of your ulama of hadith said it is authentic. That woman at that very moment felt the need to correct a big mistake. We would say if we were to be in a gathering like this and a sister was in the back and the brother made a mistake, ma fi mushkila. If you want to be like that woman, get up and say, akhi, you made a mistake. Does that mean that all the men now can go and glare at her? Huh? Check her out. Wait, sister, don't sit, don't sit down. Keep standing. Let the brothers just see you. Barakallah fikum. So she will say what she will say and she will sit down and we will all lower our gaze. How is that equal to a sister sitting behind a microphone speaking to you and you looking at her the whole time with a special henna just for you? Special design, flowers and leaves and all that stuff. And the brother, mashallah, is focusing only on the topic. How is that the same? So look at all these weak and, and lousy evidences which go against solid irrefutable evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah about this not being allowed in Islam. How in the world are you going to justify? We say very often for these like that one lady who's an activist, I don't want to mention her name because her name is not worth mentioning, who started this whole fitna, by the way, very often it's not her fault. May Allah guide us and guide her. This is what she learned from the modernists in her respective country where they make now mixed gatherings and a brother will be sitting here and a sister, they invite now, this is the new thing in, in America, huh? a brother will be sitting here and they invite a sister to co-lecture and the brother will sit next to her and look at her and say, Wallahi, we, we thought that the sister is excellent and she could benefit you, so we'll bring her every week inshallah, so she will give you a talk. La ya shaykh, this is the knowledge of the Quran, this is what it produced, the knowledge of the Quran, that's what it produced, you bring a woman to, to address the brothers, Ya Akhi. Yani, under what circumstance would this be allowed in our religion? When did this happen in the Ummah? 
of the Prophet Ali والسلام, until nowadays. And had these women, yani, wallahi, akhi, had she been wearing any qab, huh, with only one eye visible, the brothers would be checking out that one eye, by the way. No, these sisters come with no niqab, no batikh, huh? special color for hijab for you, and most 90% of them have their eyebrow, eyebrows plucked. Very clean eyebrows, done to perfection. This is the message you propagated to the sisters as well. Because she has to look good before she lectures the brothers. Just in case one of them, like that brother over there said, MashaAllah, sister so beautiful, I want to marry her. But then if you're a husband, yakhi, would you allow your wife to be sitting there speaking in front of a bunch of men, giving them a talk? And, and the, discussing what? And this is the, the irony of this whole thing. And the discussion is, قال الله قال الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام So now we have this issue in these modern days. Now here is something interesting of the ahadith. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ wherein he said that Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah's Messenger cursed the men who resemble women and the women who resemble men. And these women don't realize that they have fallen into that very hadith. They are actually, the hadith is 100% applicable to them. In fact, some of the ulama said this whole new phenomena now of a brother not working, rather his wife working or however you want it. Once the sister goes out in the morning to work and comes back at night home without necessity. Now we understand if the family is poor and there's no, not enough income or there's no man in the house or whatever the situation may be, no one is going to say anything. Allah al-Musta'an, may Allah facilitate the affair of the sisters. But if the husband is capable of spending over his wife, spending on her, and then she goes out to work, like a man goes out, she's actually resembling men. By imitating men, going out in the morning, coming back at night. This is the actual role of men ever since ever. From the very beginning, when Allah Azza wa Jal spoke to Adam, after they, the Adam and Eve violated the command of Allah and they ate from the tree. Who knows the ayah? I believe it's in Surah Taha. Right? When Allah Azza wa Jal was speaking to both of them, He said, لَا يُخْرِجَنُّكُمْ, لا يخرجنكم الشَّيْطَانُ مِنْهَا فَتَشْقَى He was speaking to both of them, don't let Satan deceive you by making you eat from the tree, otherwise, now in the singular, to Adam, فَتَشْقَى You will become wretched. Only to Adam. And the ulama say, because it was the role of Adam who would have to go out and make a living, not Eve, not Hawa, it would be Adam's job alayhi salam. And therefore Allah, even though the whole context was dual, 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 when it came to this issue, it became singular. Because that's Adam's role. From the very beginning. And we said, exception to the rule, sister who has to work. May Allah make it easy for her because of her situation. But these are many examples where these women, are, they are cursed. And we understand the, the curse. La'na is, is being deprived of the mercy of Allah. So the sister is giving a lecture in order to attain Allah's mercy. And while doing it, she's attaining the curse of Allah. It defeats the very purpose of why she's doing what she's doing. And this is why it has always been said, it is not about memorizing the Qur'an and the Sunnah. It is, a, it is about understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the early generations. Because only with this understanding you will be able to see it in this manner. Without the understanding you can see things in a very different way. Sister, you want the mercy of Allah, why are you resembling men? Why are you resembling men? In the dress code, in the appearance, in the manner, and so on and so forth. And, and the other way around for the men who are resembling women. Both of them are cursed in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so here, Islam went to the extent of telling the women as opposed to what they're doing, because at the time of Jahiliyyah they used to hang out a lot. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنْ And remain in your homes. وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى And do not display yourself in this adornment of yours as you did in the days of Jahiliyyah. And so the Prophet ﷺ would be compared to what? الْعَذْرَاء فِي خِدْرِهَا he was, he was more modest, he had more shyness than the virgin girl in her, in her little place inside the house. Because back then, they were that shy and modest. 
Now the women go out and they, they act uh, as if it is a total, uh, a total equality with men. And if you speak about these issues, you become a young a fool buck who puts his foot in his mouth every time he wants to speak about women, blah, blah, blah. Ya Shaykh Afukina, Allah yarda alayki. Stick to your activism and whatever you're busy with about fighting for this right and that right in this country and all this politics. Stick to that. Leave alone the business of the other matters to those who are working on that. Don't get involved and in, in stick your nose in areas that is, that is not going to benefit you. It will backfire and it will make everybody look bad. We have to know the roles that each one has to play. If you don't know about politics, don't speak about them. I have nothing to do with activists, you know, and all these the, the agendas of the different countries. This is not my thing. Some people go find, sign every petition and find out every country which is banning niqab and everything. It's their thing. Alhamdulillah, they are fulfilling one need of the ummah. And there are other people who are trying to fulfill another need. Let's not mix and match here. So we will not get things confused and the people confused. Specifically when we're going to use bad words and, and, and insults when we don't know what we're speaking about. This is a matter that is clear cut in our religion. It is not a debatable matter where we can, you can have an opinion and he can have an opinion. It's a done deal. Because the Quran and the Sunnah had sealed it from way back. Of course the evidences are too many. We have another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ which really tells us about the role of women in Islam. And this hadith, of course, the women don't like to hear. All, many of these hadith, usually actually, even the men don't say them. Yeah, and just to let you know, the, the male speakers avoid this particular hadith because they worry that the sisters' feelings will be hurt. But the truth of the matter is that these hadith exist. And when push comes to shove, we have to also share them with the other gender. So they will know their limits and they will stop crossing these red lines which they shouldn't cross. These are hadith usually you don't hear, but now it's time. Since you asked for it, now you get to know the truth. He said, alayhi sallam, istawsu bin nisa'i khayran, fa innahunna awanun indakum. Treat the women well. For they are like slaves with you. He compared a woman with her husband as a slave. A slave is someone whom you own. It's your property because slavery existed and it exists until today. But not the race, racism. A type of slavery where uh, you know black and white and different colors of human beings that's irrelevant but from the time of the prophet before the time of the prophet ﷺ, until today in some way shape or form the idea of slavery exists and someone just sent me a message yesterday on on whatsapp he said uh, can can um, can a person have sexual relations with the with the lady that they hired that cleans the house is she considered like a you know, right hand possession? I was like, are you serious? <laughs> I said, that's, that's Zina, man. She's a maid. I told him, he didn't know. That. I said, she's a maid. They call them maids. She's not a, a right hand possession. He's like, so it is not allowed to have with her? I said, man, you better stop asking these questions. Go look it up on Islam QA. I mean, really? Wilderness. So anyways, the hadith said that they are like slaves, they have no real control. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. And that's how we advise the woman. Like we said, nowadays you have to advise the woman whom the husband has become like a slave who's owned by his wife. She runs the show and she says what's up and she makes the decisions and you have to eat this food, but I don't like this food, you better start liking it because that's all I'm going to cook. لا يا شيخة. See that door over there? A whole camel can go through it. بارك الله فيك. Go back to your daddy's house. That's how it's supposed to be. What are you talking about? This is to say, oh, yes, you know, you're helping the husbands against their wives. No, no, we have to know who's doing what in this world. If you want to wear the pants, as they say in this relationship, then you're a man. And I believe every, every brother was looking for a woman when he wanted to get married. 
something feminine and nice and soft. Not some dude, he's gonna have to share, you know, things with at home and have to debate with all the time. But this is the, the idea which is being now, they empower the sisters, especially these, you know, special modern speakers. Always defending the sisters, defending the sisters, trying to gain some, you know, good points with the ladies. Maybe one will offer herself in marriage or something. Allahu alam what the intentions are. Always trying to defend the sisters. What about the brothers, Akhi? Who's going to defend the brothers? Let's defend the brothers today. We say to the sister, no one is telling you, you are unimportant. Ultimately, every man who has some intellect will refer to his wife. He will seek her advice. He will, help, he will have her decide on so many matters which he knows he is not capable of. The man himself will give up these certain things unless he's a lunatic. He will share, he will open up, and you can just receive. But if you try to force yourself and impose yourself in this manner, this is not a way a woman should behave. You can fight and so on and so forth, it's normal. But at the end of the day, the hadith says that the woman is like a slave. So you have to look after that woman. You have to look after her. So now, things have become very different. And we have another hadith which also supports the position that the Prophet ﷺ had said that the prayer of the woman at home is better than her prayer in the masjid. And they say he said this while the masjid was which masjid? Al Masjid al Nabawi. So the salah in the Masjid al Nabawi is equivalent to how many salah? A thousand. A thousand. One salah equals one thousand. Yet he said to the woman, Your prayer at home is better than your prayer in the masjid. Why do you think that? Because in a, at home she is secluded. She is neither a fitna yeah, for herself or for others. And this is supported by the other hadith that al mar'a awra. The woman, all of her, is like uh, uh, something which should be hidden. If she goes out, istashrafaha shaitan. The shaitan welcomes her. And that word, that particular word in the Arabic language, istishraf, is when you, when, you, when you raise your eyes and you put your hand like this to see clearly. You know, if there's some sun, this is istishraf. So as soon as the woman goes out, the shaitan, automatically, he takes advantage of her, uh, uh, her, uh, her presence. And so he tries to either misguide her or make her a source of misguidance to others. Another hadith which the women don't like to hear. And therefore, the women are told to pray at home. However, you cannot prevent them from praying in the masjid. But when they go to the masjid, the ulama lay down some very strict conditions. She has to go covered completely, no adornment, no perfume, huh? not mixing with men at the entrance and the exit, nor walking in the middle of the street. And all of these conditions, so much so that in the salah, in the salah, if the Imam were to make a mistake, is a woman even allowed to say Subhanallah? La. What is she supposed to do? How can anyone miss all of this? Can anyone say, can anyone deny the fact that if we were all in Salah, huh, and, and by Qaddar Allah the Imam made a mistake and a sister said Subhanallah, wouldn't you think this is the most practical time for you not to worry about it because you are in your salah i mean technically speaking you would that would be the last thing you think about but because it creates an opportunity for some sister who has a beautiful voice the shaitan will automatically use this and divert you from your salah instantly you will start thinking i wonder which one she is and i wonder and i wonder and you start wondering all kinds of things because that's the shaitan's job anyways so because of this very slight possibility, which may occur among some, not others, Islam closed the door, said, no, you only clap, you don't even say subhanallah. This is if you come to the masjid. How about giving a lecture, Yashir? 
How about giving a lecture where the whole lecture is saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wa La Ilaha Illallah, Wallahu Akbar Not only, not only you're not clapping, no, you're giving a whole talk And the audience is not sisters like you, no, brothers as well sitting over there How can someone ignore, turn a blind eye, disregard all of these ahadith Which leave no room for negotiation I mean they're right in your face, hello, wake up this is our religion. Now they want to twist and turn and modify and alter just like the Christians and the Jews. And we will follow the footsteps of the Christians and the Jews. They love to change their religion. Come on, you know the Christians. They love to change their religion. Change, change, alter, modify. Every day they come up with something new as per the need. And we're following the, 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 we're following the same footsteps. Did you know that there's a gay imam now? Wallahi is gay. No, and it's public. Google it. Ask Sheikh Google. He, not only is gay, he has come out and he is, he is very outspoken about it and he helps other gay Muslims who need assistance and he's the imam of a masjid. He's the, he's the person that people refer to in the matters of religion. We did not hear about this until we heard it in priesthood. And now it's coming on to Islam. Because the Prophet ﷺ, you will follow their footsteps. Even if they entered into the hole of a lizard, you will creep right into it. And this issue of female women addressing the men and speaking to them and be co-lecturing with them and all this is an, a, another classic example of the materialization of this hadith. So we say Islam calls to balance. Balance. No one is saying to the sisters, zip your mouth and tape it and sit at home, don't, don't say nothing. La, la. Continue to give da'wah. Continue to exert yourself. The ummah needs you amongst your own gender. Do this within your own environment, amongst other sisters. We all appreciate it. Men and women appreciate it. But when it comes to the affairs of men, let men handle the affairs of men. And if we were to say that we have reached a point out of necessity, where women have to address men, this is a calamity because you're claiming that there aren't enough men to do the job. And we all know that there are plenty of men to do the job of da'wah. We have not reached the stage in the ummah where we need a sister now who's more educated than the brothers to be able to lecture the brothers. We have not reached the stage. Alhamdulillah. And this is a stage which cannot even be reached because always and forever the ilm has been inherited by the men to the men. And the women get their share of it. And Islam was so keen on this. And this is even one of our shortcomings. That when the women wanted to learn at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, what did they do? They requested that a special day will be given to them. Where the Prophet ﷺ would go and give them their own dedicated class. As opposed to them being present also in the same location. All this as means of reinforcing this idea. So we say the natural condition of the human beings is that men and women are not the same. Let us stop trying to claim otherwise. We are not going to fool anyone and we're surely fooling ourselves by trying to shove down the throats of people that men and women are the same in every way, shape or form. And that whatever a man does, a woman can do, this is not the case. We, are the, we men are the first to admit there are thousands of things that the woman can do which we cannot do. Thousands of things, we admit. So why can't the woman admit the same thing? That there are hundreds of thousands of things which we can do that they cannot do. Sorry for adding some numbers there, some zeros. Seriously, just admit it. We're not the same. And once we all come to this very reasonable, logical conclusion, then the ummah can move in a healthy way towards the objective which was decreed for us from the very beginning. We want the revival of the Ummah, but we're doing it upon a foundation very different than that of the Sahaba. They bring evidences about when the Muslims had to go into war, then the women were sitting there with them and so on and so forth. They make it seem like it was, you know, uh, uh, the men and women were going hanging out together while they were serving dying people. We say necessity is taken into consideration. Yes, there could be something where women have to get involved. At a, at a scale larger than what we have today, no doubt when it is necessity. 
But you cannot compare the woman getting involved in helping the wounded in a war to a sister lecturing brothers in, in, a, in a masjid with an organized event. These, th these can never be the same kind of necessity unless you have some different standards in life. They're totally different. So to move in a healthy way, we have to go back to, go back to these solid foundations of our righteous predecessors. And one of them is that the men do the job of men and the women do the job of women. So this whole thing has to be put to an end. I advise all the brothers and sisters in Islam and specifically those who live in the Western world who are often exposed to this mode or this kind of Islam that is very different than the actual teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah, be careful. Be careful of this hidden agenda that is being, uh, you know, is being controlled and acted out and materialized by actual people who are supposed to be bringing guidance. Unfortunately, there's a deceit, deliberate or, or, or not, intentional or unintentional, it's none of our business. Allah knows about the intentions of the people. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, this is the end result. We're being confused. We are, we are being confused by the message that is being delivered. The only way you can clear this confusion is when you refer back to the Quran and the Sunnah, not according to anyone, according to the righteous predecessors. Because that person I was telling you about earlier, that Mufti, he was saying the whole time, we are, he told this uh, Diobandi, he said, you're not real Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, you're Ahlul Batil. We the Barilvis, we are the real Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And obviously Wahhabis are Kuffar, and the Diobandi is misguided, and he is the real Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And he kept saying to the people, we are teaching the people the Quran and the Sunnah, the Hadith. Not Hadith, Hadith. We take him back to the Hadith. He has the Hadith. We don't know the Hadith, supposedly. No one knows the Hadith and the Quran. So everybody will tell you they're teaching the Quran and the Sunnah. That's everybody's claim. The one who tells you that praying behind the, the Imam of the Haram will make your Salah invalid and sinful is also claiming that he is deducing this ruling from the Quran and the Sunnah. Something amazing. So everybody will say Quran and the Sunnah, but that's not. The Quran and the Sunnah has to be attached to the understanding of the righteous predecessors. So if we were to ask the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, did you ever have a woman teach you the deen face to face without a veil? Show us a single evidence in the history of Islam where a woman was teaching the men face to face without a veil. Bring this authentic evidence so we can say we can follow them. We have an example from those who came before. But Alhamdulillah, fortunately, there's no such evidence. No such evidence. So that really concludes this hot discussion on uh, this uh, hot topic which has, you know, uh, arose or which, uh, which arose actually a few weeks because of someone, uh, you know, being very nice to, to different Muslims. And so we just had to clarify it for those who are confused. Because we know at the end of the day, you will still be bashed and you'll say blah, blah, blah. you this, you know, sick-minded Wahhabi, this and that. This has become the norm. But for those who are actually confused and did not know about the textual evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah, they get a fair shot at being, uh, you know, having this presented to them. Then Allah is the one who guides. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide us all to what is pleasing to Him.